without further ado, let's go ahead and go over to Brian's logic and listen to his presentation, which was a response to my conclusive evidence that the Earth is not flat uh, by way of looking at the distance between Sydney, Australia and Perth, Australia. Okay, this is a response to Bob Design's guy. Uh, he was making a claim recently, or past boy, saying it, and I, I kind of let it go of saying it, and I, I didn't do anything about it. I didn't pay much attention to it, but I kept hearing this claim, and uh, he was making it on Bev, Troy Thinking Sour, and different places. Um, or that's why I'm hearing a lot about it. <clears throat> so I said, I had enough of it, and I'm just going to call it out for what it was, which was dishonesty. Bob is using the Haversine formula, okay? Now, I had two in my last video, which I will link in the description, and I will link Bob's response to me in the description of this video. In my original video, I pointed out that the Haversine formula requires an OR measurement, okay? And he's using it in relation to, it's used in relation to the globe out. But we don't have any OR measurement to the earth. We have a flat plane. We don't have any proof of a globe. And the main proof of a globe would be an oral measurement. We don't have it. It's a mathematical position, an, uh, an imaginary position that is in the mathematics, even admitted by uh, celestial navigation, who've known, it seems, for must be decades, centuries, that this geometric horizon that they mathematically do a dip to doesn't exist because they call the actual horizon, the only one we know, they call that the real horizon. And after they do their dip to past the real horizon to their geometric horizon, their mathematical horizon, they then do a height of height correction, uh, which brings that line back up and the line from the observer's position down below the boat and they end up with a horizontal line across the across, you know, a flat out. Now let's go ahead and just take a brief second and see exactly what Brian's talking about. Um, there are two different ways of looking of calculating the distance between two known points on the surface of the Earth. Now latitude and longitude describe a a single point on the Earth. And I've challenged flat earthers to either accept that as a true location or position on the surface of the earth, or go ahead and do a screenshot from your iPhone or from your phone of your current latitude and longitude and see whether or not I can send you a picture of where you are within about two minutes. And so far, I haven't had any takers because they're really big into saying, oh, it's all just stars, it's all, you know, it's just mathematics, etc. Okay, well, give me yours right now. And then they won't do it because they know that I've got them. Uh, I, can, I can locate them with latitude and longitude with no problems. Now, there are two ways of calculating the distance between two points, and the points that we're using are Perth, Australia and Sydney, Australia, both of which have known latitudes and longitudes. Perth is 31.95 uh, south and 115.86 east. Sydney, on the other hand, is 33.87 south and 115.21 east. Those are very specific points. Now, on a flat Earth, what we can do is we can draw a tr two lines, one from Perth, Australia, to the North Pole, which is 7,317 nautical miles long because each line of latitude as you go from the South Pole to the North Pole, every single degree is exactly 60 nautical miles apart. Likewise, we can do the same thing with Sydney and it's 7,332 nautical miles. Now, the difference in longitude between Perth and Sydney is 35.35 degrees. That gives us two sides of a triangle and the angle in between them. We can use something called the law of cosines to solve for this third side of the triangle. On a flat Earth, that would be 4,400 nautical miles. On a spherical Earth, 
what we can do is we can do a great circle, which is a circumference of the Earth, and one that passes through Sydney passes through Perth. And that gives us a D, which is a great circle distance. Now, the way that we figure out how what D is, is first we use something called the Haversine equation. The Haversine equation gives us the angle from the center of the Earth to each of these locations, Sydney and Perth. That's all it does. It gives us that angle. There are no distances involved. There's no nothing involved. If you want to find the distance between Sydney and Perth on a great circle, distance equals 2 times the radius times the arc sine of the square root of the Haversine. That's the Haversine formula. Not the Haversine equation. That's just the angle. The formula is how you use that angle to calculate distance. What Brian seems to be very confused about is that when you're dealing with a mathematical equation, we've got one term, which is distance. We have another term, which is radius of the Earth. And we have a third term, which is the Haversine. Now, we're calculating the Haversine based on the location of Perth and Sydney. If we don't know the distance, but we do know the radius, we can calculate the distance by using the radius. However, what Brian doesn't understand is if we know the actual distance between those two points along the surface of the Earth, we can use that information to calculate the radius of the Earth. The Haversine formula does not require that we know what the radius of the Earth is. If we do know it, we can figure out the distance between two points. If we don't know it, but we do know the distance between two points, we can figure out the radius. I did this on my recent trip from Panama City Beach to Michigan. I was able to successfully calculate the radius of the Earth based on the distance between those two points. Likewise, in my original uh, presentation to Brian, I determined the great circle distance between London in the UK and San Francisco in the United States. And I used that distance, which was over 6,000 kilometers, to be able to determine the radius of the Earth. The reason that I'm going through Brian's presentation today in a live stream is that he put out a 40-minute video to try and respond to me unsuccessfully, I might add. The first 30 to 35 minutes of that was just the usual flat earth fluff. And that is, oh, we don't know our, you know, Eratosthenes doesn't know what he's doing. Al Biruni didn't know what he was doing. Cartographers don't know what they're doing. Pilots and navigators don't know what they're doing because you can't have a great circle because we don't have our, therefore we don't have a sphere. Well, that's not really true. I have no idea what the radius of this globe is because I've not measured it. It's a globe. It's a sphere. By definition, it has a radius. I don't need to know what it is. But you know, I could look at the distance between two points on this and I could calculate what the radius of this sphere was. That's the way spherical trigonometry works. So let's go ahead and listen to uh, Brian for a few more and have a little fun with him. So this geometric horizon doesn't exist. It's only in the maths, even within celestial navigation. So that was the only way that it was claimed that this or value was ever measured. <clears throat> and this was by Alberoni, and he supposedly measured from uh, after having to measure a mountain using flat earth, uh, using a flat earth, having to pre-assume pre the earth was flat, to measure the height of the mountain he was going up onto. He then had to uh, go up and pre-assume that an astronomical and geometric horizon were real. And so he never measured anything. He pre-assumed, as even said officially, he pre-assumed it was a globe and he used the supposedly the maths of Pythagoras. Now, Eratosthenes, what Eratosthenes did was he me measured a portion of a flat diameter to the earth. And he had to then, and it's officially admitted, he had to then pre-assume it was a globe. And to, to make the shadows work, he had to pre-assume that it was a globe and that the sun was a, a certain size and distance and that we had parallel sun rays. Now, nobody has ever, ever, ever photographed or videoed or seen parallel sun rays. They don't exist. So they were just two pre-assumptions. No one ever measured this or value. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and just address that really quick. Uh, what he's talking about is Al Biruni measuring the height of a mountain. The question becomes is, well, how do you do that? Well, you can do it trigonometrically, and the way that you do that is you measure out a known distance, and then you take the angle to the height of the mountain, or the, from the first point, and the height of the mountain from the second point. Now, by using the tangents and some trigonometric uh, functions here, you can actually determine the height of the mountain simply by knowing the distance between those two observation points. The problem with Brian and the rest of the flat Earth is that, yes, we acknowledge that this small section of the Earth is part of the curved surface of the Earth. And in the second part of the Al Biruni equation, we realize that as you look down to the horizon, that's the refractive rather than the geometric horizon. But the one thing the flat Earth has never done, because if they did do it, they would find out how insignificant it was, if they could do it at all. The difference in angle from an observer at the top of a mountain between the apparent horizon and the geometric horizon is on the order of three minutes of angle, one twentieth of a degree. In order to accurately make a objection to that being used to determine the radius of the Earth, you would have to do two things. First of all, you would have to calculate the radius of the Earth, assuming that that was a geometric horizon. And then you would have to take into account the change in the angle due to refraction for a refracted horizon. And you would have to show that the difference in the radius you end up with is significant. By what magnitude are they different? And second, why is that magnitude of difference significant? Now, the difference in magnitude is going to be less than about 20 kilometers on the 4,000 kilometer radius of the Earth. So it's not significant because the angle is just very slight. That said, whether or not the radius of the Earth is a little bit smaller than Al Biruni measured it by the order of 1 to 3 percent, both Al Biruni's measurements and the true measurement, the unrefracted measurement, show the Earth to be a sphere. So really, what's your point, Chief? If there is a radius at all, the Earth is not flat, unless, of course, the radius is infinite. This is an objection that you're raising, but you have A, no idea how much of a difference it makes, and B, you don't realize that it doesn't help your case at all. It just doesn't. The Earth is still a sphere either way, whether you're using the refracted or the geometric horizon. So it always amuses me that these folks know so little about what they're talking about, they don't even realize their own objection betrays them. So let's go ahead and continue on a little bit. The Haversine formula is moot. It doesn't mean anything because it's only just used as a belief, a kind of like a confirmation bias. It doesn't mean anything in the real world. It's only a mathematical thing. Now, as a mathematical formula, it works. No problem with it. I didn't state out a problem with it in my video. I just called out Bob on the use of it and how he was using it. <clears throat> As he was using the, the rum line of this, uh, of the um, Haversine formula, he was claiming that as a, as a flat out or flat plane uh, a surface distance measurement. Well, it's not. It's a line, basically a chord through uh, a circle or a sphere. So it has, it has nothing to do with the surface, a surface distance, a straight line surface, horizontal dis distance measurement, nothing to do with any of it. You know, my first experience with Brian's logic was a debate on Ranty's um, old debate channel. And we were supposed to discuss the, the way a mechanical gyro compass demonstrates the rotation of the Earth. The reason that it does demonstrate the rotation of the Earth is a mechanical gyro compass requires that rotation in order to point to geographic north. The mechanical gyro compass does point to geographic north, therefore the Earth is rotating. It's just as simple as that. It's gyroscopic precession. But Brian was going to champion the flat Earth side of this argument. And the first thing that he did was start talking about the mechanical gyro compass being a magnetic compass. 
because there was mercury in it at one time. There's not mercury in it anymore, but there was mercury in it at one time, and he said that meant that it was a magnetic compass rather than a mechanical gyroscopic-based compass. He didn't even bother looking at the wiki page to see how a gyro compass worked. He had no clue. You know, in general, about two minutes into this, I realized that I'm dealing with somebody that has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. This is another good example. Let me show you what a rum line is. This is the wiki page on a rum line, and it tells you exactly what it is and what it does. The purpose of a rum line is so that on a Mercator map, you can draw a straight line connecting point A and point B, and you can sail that heading, and it will cross each line of latitude and each line of longitude at the same angle. So if you're sailing 45 degrees to your northeast, you'll cross every line of longitude at 45 degrees. And that's a very convenient thing. But the problem is, is it's not a great circle. As you can tell, it's actually a spiral. Okay, look at the angle right here where it crosses this line of longitude. Notice it's exactly the same as that angle there, which is the same as that angle and that angle. It's simply a very convenient way to navigate over the spherical Earth. You don't have to constantly adjust your heading to follow the great circle. It's longer than a great circle is. It's not going to increase your voyage on a ship significantly, you know, by more than a day or two. On an airplane, it'll be even less. It's not the shortest distance between those two points. Now compare that to a great circle distance which is basically just cutting the sphere in half. If you were to cut an orange in half through the center of the orange, you would have a great circle. Examples of great circles include all lines of longitude and the equator. But here's the important thing about this. Does that look like a chord to anyone that has passed eighth grade math? That is most definitely along the surface of a spherical object. It's a spiral along the surface. These are not chords by any way, shape, or form. He never even bothered looking up what a rum line was. He thinks that it is a chord through a sphere. One of the biggest problems that you run into with the flat earth is they use terms that they don't understand. And this is a classic example of it. A rum line is not a chord. If it was a chord, we wouldn't have another thing called a chord that is distinct from a rum line. It's a surface track across the earth. But let's go ahead and continue with his presentation. He was using that and claiming that and then doing the Haversine, using the Haversine formula to show how when he'd used the Haversine, Haversine formula that it was the, his, um, final, um, his final outcome was more correct to the actual distance. Uh, distances he was talking about but uh, the whole like the whole point of the rum line is that it r makes a straight line through um, a circle and then you use the Haversine formula for the correct let's just say if you want to use a globe projection you, you get the correct distance let's say whatever direction you're whatever you're looking to measure part of a continent or whatever well, I see once again, we need to help him out a little bit. If you look at the radius of a sphere, any sphere, it's going to have a certain distance. We don't necessarily know what it is, but we do know that if we look out at the circumference of that sphere, there's going to be a distance that equals the radius. And that's called a radian. And in 360 degrees, that equals two pi radians, because the circumference of a circle is twice the radius times pi. So you don't need to know what that R value is to understand that there's a thing called a radian, that that is 57.3 degrees. If you want to find the actual distance, you need to know what the radius is. If you do know the distance, you can calculate what the radius is. And that's what this point is right over here, which was the entire point of my video, which Brian missed. So let's go back and see what else he has to say. But there is no radius. It doesn't exist. Um, so it's just a belief, a mathematical belief formula. It has no 
like the only part of it that connects to anything in reality is the distance. Like the only part of it that connects to anything in reality is the distance it measures. But in reality, that distance is a straight line. It's not a rum line. The rum line is not the distance. It's just through the use of the have a sign formula, you're using uh, a radius. So you're, you're making it a globe. But that doesn't mean it's a globe. It means mathematically you can use the have a sign formula to make a globe out of it. But anyway, <clears throat> we'll move on, right? Because this, I have a, a little bit of reading to do and stuff. So the new, this is a mnemonic projections, right? A new, mnemonic projection is a map made by projecting points and lines from a globe onto a piece of paper that touches the globe at a single point, right? Mnemonic projections distort direction and distance between land masses. Mnemonic projections are useful in plotting long distance trips by air or sea. Now, they claim, like they admit that, or they say it distort these, these distort direction and distance, but they also say they're useful for long distance trips by air or sea. Why are they useful? Because they make the earth flat. That's why they're useful. Because you can't navigate with a globe. There is no, there is no flat earth map because no cartographer seems to ever want to make it. They make every single thing they can make. They'll make the earth flat and they'll always be starting off with a globe and they'll do a flat projection off of a globe because they need to have flat. And they'll know where the distortions are. And by doing all this, they can then make it back into a globe. But none of them actually have, have, have ever made a flat earth map. Why won't they make a realistic map of the world? Why did they avoid it? They make... Uh, conal maps, they make, uh, you know, just go here, they make, they make, where is it going to be, here, no, not this one, where is it, this one, I must have moved it on, but either way, they, the point is that they, they make a flat map, and then they can use XYZ type coordinates, Cartesian, flat coordinates, right, and they can use latitude, longitude, obviously, as well, but with, when it comes to the globe, they can't use any of it, right, they have latitude and longitude on it, but you can't navigate with it. You can't navigate with a globe. You have to use flat maps. Now, of course, that's utterly ridiculous. We met, we navigate with globes all the time. Uh, Google Earth, of course, is a globe. And that's something that we can use to navigate very nicely. So, for instance, if I want to go from Michigan, and that's about my location in Michigan, and I want to go down here to, say, San Antonio, Texas, that, that is the actual course that I would take. And as you can see by looking at it on edge, it's a curved line. That is because all measurements on Google Earth are great circle measurements. That is a great circle distance between here in Michigan and Texas. It's just as simple as that. So here is the great circle between London and the UK and Hawaii in the United States. Notice it divides the Earth into two equal halves. And it's a straight line when you look straight down on it. However, when you bring it up, that line is very clearly curved. And that is the principle behind a great circle course. And this is the way we do air navigation. Every triangle on a flat surface has interior angles of 180 degrees. This is something, again, that's lost on them. Now, for Brian to disprove my claim that distances between locations on Earth rule out the flat Earth. He has to disprove the mathematics. He hasn't even attempted to do that. I don't think that he's capable of doing it. Because here's what I did in my original video. I took Perth, Australia and Sydney, and I made a triangle from Perth to the North Pole to Sydney and back to Perth. This distance right here is known. It is the distance between Perth and the North Pole along a line of longitude, which is a great circle. This distance is also known. And that is also a line of longitude going through Sydney and the North Pole. So by knowing those two sides and knowing the difference in longitude between the two of them, I can calculate the third side of this triangle. Now, when you do that, it comes out to 4,400 nautical miles. When you do it via the Haversine formula right here, it comes out 
to 1,777 nautical miles. The actual measured distance between Sydney and Perth is 1,778 miles, which matches. That's less than one half the distance it would have to be if it was a triangle on a flat surface. Because you can't change these distances and you can't change that angle. It doesn't matter what it looks like on a map. Those are, that's the distance between those two points. Now when you do it on the Gleason's map, it actually works out correctly. All right. It's 6.25 inches from the North Pole to Perth. It's 6.5 inches from the North Pole to Sydney. And it's 3.85 inches between Sydney and Perth. Brian cannot accept that because I don't think he comprehends what I was even doing and thinks that a rum line somehow is a cord. He thought I was measuring cords. I had nothing to do with cords. I had nothing to do with the radius of the earth. So let's go ahead and continue on with this, this silliness because I want to give Brian his full measure of a chance to make his case. There's no way around it. You can't navigate with a globe. If you could, they would be doing it. You know, we are doing it. If it was it. easy to do this, you would do it, but you can't because we don't. The globe is not the reality. So, the mnemonic <clears throat> projection. This is used for the reason. This is used for. Or I'm showing this is that I'm showing what they do, and this is used for great circle routes. Okay, the mnemonic projection is the best projection for great circle routes. What they call great circle routes, right? So, for a great circle route, the best projection is flat, right? That is it. They, they need to flatten the earth, right, to to use these great circle routes. So it's nonsense, but we're used to it. As I said, show it here, right, once they flatten the earth, they can use X, Y, Z if they want, right, because Cartesian works then, right? So the map plane, they have to take the globe and flatten it. And how they do it is they'll take the polar, uh, polar position, they say the North Pole, and they flatten it down, right? That's what they do. Um, and uh, these, this is what this is a kind of a, a representation of what they do. When it comes to great circle routes, you will often find lots of um, <clears throat> you find lots of um, projections showing the north and the North Pole and the whole north of the globe. Just let's say this is the North Pole here, and this is the Antarctica down here. You find lots of projections like this where they show the northern part of the world. Uh, anywhere north of the equator, and you see it as a projection. But then you will often see a lot of uh, a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, let's say um, similar projections where it'll be sectional. You might just get a part of Africa or Philippines or whatever, right? Uh, and they do have Antarctica-based projections as well, but they only show a small little bit of the tip of Chile, and you and you don't see much else, right? So, but you will mainly see north projections where they flatten it out using the basically an AE map type map, right? Now they don't use the AE map uh, for this because it has to be more precise, so they use sectional maps, right? But they will use the north, they will use the north, but they won't use the south, right? Even though they have an Antarctica map, they don't really use it, not to the same degree, they'll mostly use sectional, right? So either way, they have to flatten everything. To make it work, to use it, they have to flatten it. That's the point. Right. And this is what great this is how great circle routes this is what they do. They need to flatten flatten out their their, their globe to use these great circle routes. Right. So <clears throat> here is uh, a more in-depth realistic one. This uh this is um uh, uh more precise. Um and this is one day. just to kind of give you a quick second, this right here is a AE map centered on Sydney, Australia, which is just as valid as the Gleason map is. Makes the earth look a little different. Where's the ice wall, man? That all looks like water out there. You could actually use, I think this is one of those uh, projections, one of these uh, mnemonic projections, um, where it has a lot more detail to it and blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is only one you obviously have. This is obviously in a book or something. You'll probably have 
a book of maps and you'll go on to the next page and there'll be the next section over here you'll see over this part or the, over that side of the us or what you know this is northern no this kind of us and northern canada here so <clears throat> this is what it looks like here is another one right uh, this is once again this is ireland down here and you have northern canada and all that over here so once again the northern projection right so these are what these are what those maps are these are the ones they will use for great circle routes probably i i don't know i don't uh, i don't think i ever saw i don't know if i've ever looked at a whole lot of uh uh flight maps and stuff but i wouldn't say they'd be i i would sure i'm pretty much sure if they're using great circle routes that they're going to use these type of maps um may not, these may not be exactly the same as flight maps because they obviously have other things on it but they will be using these uh, these type of maps and they'll be sectional they might have a section for uh maybe this part of europe and another section for the next part and blah 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 right now the purpose of a gnomic projection is that if you draw a straight line from new york to London, that will actually follow a great circle course. The only straight lines that are going to be on this are the lines of longitude and the equator. But in any event, we'll continue with this stuff. We get it, right? <clears throat> but the point is, they have to flatten out the earth and they have to flatten everything to use their great circle routes, right? Great circle routes are a joke. Did nobody can fly a great circle route and end up back where they started. Actually, I fly them all the time. So does Wolfie and every other airline pilot. End up somewhere else. Somewhere else. There's no way around it. So, now, now, summarize why great circle routes are commonly used in navigation, right? <clears throat> so this is the one of the best I found because it shows so much detail. These are all the the parts in it. So I won't read all of it because there's some parts you won't need to read, and it'll get a bit, a bit tedious, right? So. <clears throat> All right, before he even gets started, now mind you, this is his citation. Look at that right there. They represent the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. That is why we use great circles for navigation. You know, you would think that if you pulled up a citation, you would actually read what was in the citation, Brian. Your own citations confirm that the reason great circles are used on the Earth is because the surface of the Earth is curved. It's a sphere. If navigation routes and distances match the great circle route and distance, it's a sphere. If it doesn't, it could be some other shape, maybe flat. But then it would match the flat distance, wouldn't it? And as we've already seen, it doesn't. So why you wanted to just dwell on this point, I don't know. It's not helping you. But I'm going to show you what Bob did, right, when he, in his response to me. What I called Bob out for originally, right, he tried to do the same thing, right, as a response to me. This is what he tried to do. It's really sneaky, right? I must think I'm totally stupid. This is the Goa Peters, right, projection. Now, it doesn't show all the continents in their correct placements, but it's, it's claimed, the claim, right, is that it shows the continents in their correct sizes, right? So these are supposedly the correct sizes of the continents, right? Africa is this size as opposed to Greenland being looking like on other projections, like it's like that it's uh, almost half the size of Africa. It's not. I think Africa is 14 times bigger. This is the actual width of Australia, supposedly. I have to measure it. <clears throat> this is the length of South America, blah, blah, blah. Right. This is how North Ireland and the UK is. Uh, up there is, uh, here is uh, Finland, I think, up here. You know, so this is, this is what's claimed to be the actual sizes of the continent. Now, what Bob did was this. He took this, right, this Gleason's map. Because I used the license map in my last um, video to him. And what he did is he drew a line from the north here to Perth and the north to Sydney, right? Now, as you can see, if you look at the size of Australia compared to the United States here, when I flew, right, I flew from Ireland to the UK, right? And I got an international flight in London and I flew this way. I think I went over part of Greenland. I did and came down here. 
uh, along uh, True Canada. I just want to stop here for half a moment and mention the fact that he flew from Ireland to the UK to get an international flight. So he went the opposite direction. He went east before he flew west. But he doesn't understand why people might actually go into the northern hemisphere between two locations on the south and the southern hemisphere. Down into Utah, into um, Nevada, and then into southern southern uh, California. That was the route I took. It was basically a straight line, as much as you could make it, to there, from the UK to there. So I would say this is pretty accurate. Here, if you look at just this section here, the Gleason's map is pretty accurate for that part, right? Now, obviously, if we look at, I'll just get this back down. If we look at this, right, Africa and South America look bigger and longer, right? Australia looks, let's say, higher, let's just say, right? Not as wide, right? And as you can see, Australia is bigger than North America. It does look to be bigger in, than North America because uh, you have North America and Canada up here. Now, North America may be a little bit wider, but Australia is is uh, maybe longer or something, right? It definitely seems to have a bigger land, a slightly bigger land mass. But either way, right? This is what it acts. This is what is claimed to be the the actual, right? What what they act, what the continents actually look like in comparison to each other. Now it's obvious that this here is obviously wrong, <clears throat> and it's admitted to be so, right? So Australia on the Glacis map is admitted to being distorted. Now. I don't know whether it definitely is distorted. I don't know if that's the actual size of it. I, I don't know that. I, I would say it is distorted because this is the Gleason's map is a projection of a globe, right, flattened out. And the whole point of it is to, so you had a long, uh, to make it into a longitudinal and time calculator, right? So what Bob did is he put two lines from Sydney to the North Pole and Perth to the North Pole, and he then did this, made a rum line here, right? And then he did use the Haversheim formula using the radius of his globe that doesn't exist. And he corrected the distance across here, right? Well, except, of course, that's not what I did at all. I did this. The first thing that I did was I created a line from the North Pole to Perth and, a North, and the North Pole to Sydney. And then I used the law of cosines and that angle between them to solve for that line. And it was 44,000 nautical miles. Then, without doing anything else to that, that was the flat Earth distance. Then I, from scratch, calculated the Haversine between Perth and Sydney. And then I used the, the distance to the, the radius of the Earth to calculate the distance between the two of them and compared that to the actual flight distance. They matched. They matched this, not that. That's what I did, and that's why I ruled out the possibility of a flat Earth, because by definition, it cannot be flat. 1,777 miles is not 4,400 miles. They're not even close, and the measured distance matched the globe Earth distance. That's what I did, Brian. You're too dumb to even understand how I destroyed your argument. I hope that clarifies it for you. Pointed out that he says, now, see, the rum line is not the distance, but the rum line is a cord running through a sphere and through a circle. It is not a surface distance. It's a, it's a way of undistorting a distorted image. This is a distortion of a globe projection, and he's undistorting it by using the globe. But that doesn't mean anything. The argument is not the size of the continents, right? The argument is the placement of the continents and the distances in the oceans, right, south of the equator. That's the argument. So what all Bob did was the same thing as he originally did. And what he originally did was this, right? He went from Chicago, I think it was, here, to, I think it was Denver, right? Somewhere like that down here, or Phoenix. And he put a ROM line, right? On, on that, right? And then he used the Haversheim formula, which which then added R, right? Which gave a more correct distance. Because the reason it gives a more correct distance is because the globe projection has the actual distances as close as possible, right? 
or the claimed actual distance is as close as possible to reality. But that doesn't make the earth curved. It means that your correct distances are curved on your globe. So you have to be kind of flat distances on your globe. You know, Brian, for God's sake, did you hear what you just said? But that doesn't make the earth curved. It means that your correct distances are curved on your globe. So you have to be kind of flat distances on your globe. I mean, seriously, do you even listen to yourself? Next time, have your wife, have one of your kids, have a, have a trusted neighbor or preferably a mental health professional listen to you when you talk because you just contradicted yourself. Yes, there is a reason that the true distances are on a flipping globe. It's because the Earth, Brian, is a globe. And if you use a globe and measure distances across it, that's the distance that it is. All right? The Earth is not flat. You cannot form a triangle and get accurate distances between two points. You can use the Haver sign and find the curved surface distance between those two points because the Earth is a globe of radius 3959. Just stop with this stuff. You are embarrassing yourself. Come on, man. If you really want to learn about this, I will teach you. But just stop this. That doesn't matter because there is no radius value. There is no or measured to use. It's complete and utter nonsense. And that was my original point. You can't use the Harrison formula without an or measurement, which doesn't, and that doesn't exist. So I called him out originally on using this straight line here and claiming, you know, a straight line distance here somewhere. <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was there, exactly there, could have been like this or whatever. But <coughs> I called out Bob on that and claiming a rum line, which is a chord, as a straight line flat earth distance, right? Which is not correct. It's not a surface distance. It's, a, it's basically a chord through a circular sphere. And he was trying to compare that to basically all he was doing was undistorting a distorted globe. That's all he was doing. And that's the whole point. And he's trying to do the same thing over here. He done this nonsense over here, put that here, put that to that. And then he showed then that Australia was not as wide as that or not as long as that. Right. And he tried to use that again. It's just the same, same ridiculous trick that I was calling him out on. So he must think I'm totally stupid. This is claimed to be what Australia looks like. This is obviously a distortion. Because this is a globe map, right? Flattened out. So it's distorted. You know, so he's undistorting his globe using globe maps. But what has any of that got to do with reality? In reality, there is no measured or value, right? Rum lines are not straight line distances along the surface of Earth. But these were my two points, and he didn't address them at all. So, Bob, unless you want to address those two points, how there isn't an R value measured anywhere for the Earth, and how you're using an R value, and how you're using a rum line, which is basically a chord, as a straight line distance along the surface, when rum lines are not surface, they're not, they're not a surface measurement at all. They're used within the Haversine formula to undistort a globe projection back into a globe. Brian, Brian, Brian. First, we have R. Second, a rum line is not a chord. This is just really bad, Brian. All right. Not only do you completely misrepresent what I did, you have no awareness of how I did it or what it means. What I did was I showed conclusively the earth cannot be flat. The fact that you don't comprehend that is lost on you, but it's not lost on the audience. Everybody that is listening to this right now has got a much better picture of your misunderstanding. They understand what I'm talking about. They have, they see that you have no clue. And that's embarrassing, Brian. You really should have taken me up on that offer. Maybe next time. And by the way, I did address your issues. You have not addressed mine, which is to prove the math is wrong. But in the meantime, I think that that pretty much covers Brian's logic. Hopefully he's learned his lesson and will not try this again. And if he does, I may have to actually be rough on him next time. I was nice this time.